It's LeVac and Goss on 104.5 The Team. We are live from the Rivers Casino and Resort getting ready for a rumble on the river tomorrow night. The weigh-in about to get underway uh, here in um, uh, just just a little bit. Uh, Brian Cody from one of our sister stations uh, is actually I'm seeing the weigh-in, so we'll have him uh, to, to go through that. But uh, we are lucky enough now to be joined by our friend Mike Rodak, who covers the bills for the mothership, ESPN and ESPN.com. Uh, Mike, my, my biggest question was, if you're a Bills fan and you see Robert Woods and Sammy Watkins, both six catches, both over 100 yards, Watkins with the two touchdowns, do you, do you get a little a little upset that they gave up on those two guys maybe too soon? Yeah, I mean, more with Watkins than Woods. Because, I mean, look at it. I mean, Woods' contract was $7 million per year. So I don't think I would have paid that based on what they got out of him. You know, the last four years, I don't think he was nearly worth that much. But Watkins was on a cheaper deal. Um, he was obviously someone who they planned on having this year. It wasn't like he was a free agent. And they made the decision to, to make that trade and to get EJ Gaines and to get that second round pick. So, um, it's, it's obviously, it's going to take a while for that trade to really play out and for us to see whether that was the right call. But the Woods, the Woods and, and even Marquise Goodwin who had a big catch Thursday night. Those guys signed for, I think, a lot more than they would have been worth the bill. So I think if you're going to be upset about somebody, be upset about walking. The Bills wide receivers now, Zay Jones, Andre Holmes, Jordan Matthews. Let's go back to week two in Zay Jones. He has a chance at the end of the game to haul in a catch to win it for Buffalo. What was he like in the locker room following the loss? Yeah, he was pretty broken up, as you might expect a 22-year-old to be. I know some people said he was in tears. I didn't personally see that, but just, uh, you know, there was a, a group of cameras around him, and it was pretty uh, grim um uh, emotion from him, I would say, is, is the best way to, to describe it. But he was fine. When we talked to him on Wednesday back in the locker room here, he said it, it took 24 hours. He, he got over it, and he was back to being his normal self. And it sure seemed like it, just talking to him. And he had a couple of former Bills players reach out to him, Stevie Johnson and Andre Reid, both on Twitter and then uh, privately as well. Both of those guys talked to, uh, to Zay and, and tried to encourage him and obviously say that it's just one play and he has a, a career ahead of him. Um, and look, at the bottom, the bottom line here is I don't think that was a easy ball to catch by any stretch of the imagination. It was a very difficult catch for Zay Jones uh, to make, especially in that situation. I don't think it was a great throw from Tyrod Taylor. So if something went wrong for him on that play, it, it maybe it was more in running the route. Maybe he wasn't running exactly what Tyrod Taylor was expecting, but if he was running the correct route, then it was a bad throw from Tyrod Taylor. And Zay Jones is the last person he should be getting on. With all that movement over there at the wide receiver position, who is the number one target at the wide receiver position for Tyron Taylor? I mean, I, I would still say Jordan Matthews, um, based on his experience and, and just based on what this offense is trying to do. The West Coast offense, it's a lot of passing over the middle, which, as we've discussed before, I don't think is a strength for Tyron Taylor. But uh, the ability to get to Matthews in the short passing game is obviously going to be more important for this offense than trying to find you know, Brandon Tate or Andre Holmes or even Zay Jones uh, down the field. So he's, at the end of the season, if he stays healthy, I, I wouldn't be surprised if he's number one in terms of targets. Um, but I don't really think there's a true number one receiver on this roster. And, in fact, Charles Clay may even be that guy by season's end uh, as well. Mike Rodak with us right now, 104.5 The Team, covers the Bills for ESPN and ESPN.com. So, Mike, we're, we're having this kind of debate on the air. The Bills preparing to host the Denver Broncos. The Broncos look like world beaters. The Bills do look sound. They, they, look, they look better than I think a lot of people thought they would with the talent leaving the team. But only a three-point dog to Denver. It, do, do they have a chance of winning this game at home? They do. I mean, Trevor Simeon is still Trevor Simeon. I don't think he's He's going to be great, um, especially the way this Bills defense has played. They've allowed less than one point per possession, which is uh, fourth fewest in, in the NFL. So there's very few defenses that are playing like the Bills, but the problem is one of those defenses that's playing well is coming to town here. It's the Broncos' defense. You have Vaughn Miller coming off the edge. Now, which side of that line he'll attack, it's more than likely going to be the right side with Jordan Mills, but maybe they'll slide him over and, and have him play against the left tackle, which uh, Cordy Glenn is not going to play in this game. He has a foot injury slash an ankle injury. He did not practice on Friday. He's been ruled out. So they're going to start their rookie, Deion Dawkins, their second-round pick at left tackle. The Broncos could attack that. And then on defense, you have the Broncos' corners between Chris Harris and Aqib Tlaib. 
I just don't have any confidence that Zay Jones or Jordan Matthews would be able to do anything against those corners. They're two of the top five corners in the league. Uh, so this Broncos defense, as strong as this Bills defense might be, I think this Broncos defense will, will lead the day. Uh, so I think the only formula for the Bills to win is to simply shut down Simeon and hope that they can get some sort of turnover or a big play on offense that they weren't otherwise expecting and that maybe they can get a break to go their way in their home field. How's, La- how's LaShawn McCoy doing? You know, he's good health-wise. He, he was definitely on the injury report this week with a wrist injury. That's been bugging him ever since that Jets game when he came out in, in the, uh, the third quarter, I believe it was, early in the fourth quarter. It was numb. It was in pain. And he came back into that game. Same thing happened against the Panthers down in Carolina where he came out for a play. It looked like he was in a lot of pain with that wrist. Uh, but he's still practicing, and he's still going to play on Sunday. Uh, so it's just a matter of whether that affects his ball security at all. Uh, he says he can't hold the ball out, you know, as far as sometimes he likes to. Uh, you have to tuck it up and, and tuck it in for him, and, and hopefully that wrist holds up. But uh, otherwise, health-wise, he should be in good shape. The question is, is, is the offensive line good enough in front of him to give him the space to run? They, this offensive line did not, have, did not allow their running backs to gain any yards before contact against the Panthers, and that was the fewest yards before contact the Bills have had since ESPN started tracking that stat in 2006. So there was zero room for Shady to run down in Carolina. You add that to the fact that the receivers aren't going to get open, aren't going to make the Broncos respect the deep passing game. And even though Shady might be healthy, this running game may not be effective on Sunday. Uh, Mike Rodak with us from ESPN, ESPN.com, our Bills insider. Before we let you go, uh, Sean McDermott, I know like when we were there for camp, you guys all kind of love him because he gets up early and he, you know, he does all the things at, a, at a, you know, an earlier and maybe faster pace than Rex. Is the, uh, the Bills community, the Bills mafia, if you will, are they still in, in love with, with McDermott? Yeah, I mean, obviously there, there's some sort of honeymoon period. In fact, we asked him this week whether the honeymoon period is over. He kind of joked that he never really had one. <laughs> um, I, I still think that it's, it's still, look, he, he's not going to get fired. Fans aren't going to call him for his job by the end of this year. Even if they go 3-13, and 13, I don't think anybody's going to realistically call for his job. So he still has plenty of time here. Uh, it's only one loss now, and they, they played well enough in that game, and that's relative to this almost win it at the end. So I think fans respect that there's you know a process here, and he loves to use that word, but I think fans do realize that this is going to take some time, and, and to get on Sean McDermott so early would be a mistake. Yeah, and they've got a lot of tables to burn and throw people through in the parking lot, so I mean, they got other things to do. <laughs> <laughs> much better, much better things to do in Buffalo, especially on such a beautiful weekend. I mean, 90 degrees here. Awesome. All right. Well, that's uh, that's that's good news right there. I mean, it seems like every other time we've ever talked to you, Mike, it's been bad weather. So even when we were there, it was pouring outside. So uh, I'm glad you get some good weather for a change. <laughs> you got uh, it. Should be great. Nice, uh, well, the warmest home game in 15 years up here, actually. Wow. Now that's that's uh, yeah. global warming. Take that, um, <laughs> Mike Rodak, our ESPN uh, ESPN.com Bills insider. Man, we appreciate you you having some time for us, and uh, good luck this weekend. You got it, guys. Thank you.